Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk, the Second Avenue Subway, the Number Seven Extension, East Side Access, service cuts, higher tolls, fewer station agents, fare hikes. Yikes! Talk about New York City's and the region's lifeblood, the mass transit system, its problems and its prospects, is Jay Walder, the chairman and CEO of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority. Prior to coming back to the MTA in October 2009, Jay was a partner at McKinsey & Company. Prior to that, he was the managing director for finance and development for Transport for London, the integrated body responsible for London's transport services. He's taught at the Kennedy School at Harvard, and he began his career in 1983 at the MTA, ultimately becoming the agency's executive director and chief financial officer. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. First question. You wrote an op-ed in the Post in April saying, opening line, this isn't exactly what I signed up for. What did you sign up for and what did you get? Well, you know, it, it's, it's funny. I, um, I had discussions over a period of time about whether it was a, whether I'd come back to New York and it was a good time and, and, um, and you know, it's my home city, and I thought I thought very carefully about it. But it's part of that. You do your due diligence. You try to find out what's going on with the transit system, and and everybody, to a man and woman, said, "Gee, this is a good time to come back to the transit system because the financial problems have been solved." Um, <laughs> they lied. And, <laughs> they lied. They lied. Um, and 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 that's really my point. Was was in in you know the summer June July of last year. Um, the legislature had adopted a bailout plan in mm -hmm. May, and we did think the financial problems were solved. Maybe, maybe not solved for the long term, right. but, but solved in the short term. I wasn't in the job for more than four or six weeks before the red ink started to flow. That's, that's what I meant by that. The question is, you're a smart guy. You know Albany's dysfunctional. How could you not believe that getting into this spider web that's Albany would be problematic? Because it's not only the economy, it's state government. Yeah, but, but I think there was something different going on here. I think, I think that the, the point that, that we might think about from there is the, the, the Ravage Commission had done a, a, a terrific piece mm -hmm. of work really laying out yep. what the issues were with the transit yep. system. Albany, um, you know, despite what I think is well-recognized uh, difficulties that it's having right now, actually responded to that, reacted to that. It didn't do everything that, that the Ravage Commission had proposed, but it did put in place a plan to be able to deal with the MTA. It did put in place a new tax, the payroll mobility tax. Right. Um, it did change the structure of the MTA, creating actually the position I have right now, the, the chairman the, and chief executive the joint, the joint, which they had as a joint position. It did um, provide for the, uh, for the capital program to go forward as well. Now, everybody recognized in doing that that there was more to be done, that it wasn't a long-term solution. But I think the point was that Albany had acted. They had done, done this. And they had recognized, I think, and, and I think very appropriately, the critical importance of the transit system. Go ahead. No, no, but, but, but that's, so, so, you know, to look at what's going on now and clearly the difficulties that, right. that are taking place around the budget, that wasn't actually mirrored. A year ago, last May, they took the action. For example, congestion pricing. You had, you know, run Transport for London. Congestion pricing was a huge part of the London transport plan, as it was of the Ravage plan, and that got torpedoed. In some ways, that was a source of funding that could have certainly alleviated your present gaps and future out gaps. Yeah, uh, certainly. But, but look, let's, let's talk about congestion pricing Go in ahead. London, for example, because I think it's a good topic. When I went over there, the mayor of London uh, said to me, the first time I met him, he said to me, he said, I'd love to have you come here, but don't come unless you're ready to implement congestion pricing. The point I'd make about that is that the political consensus was there to do congestion pricing, and we moved into a mm -hmm. management role of how do we okay. get it done. Um, I think the New York is a little further behind in terms of the political consensus, in terms of the argument of, of congestion pricing. Second point the mayor would have made at the time was Ken Livingston, at the, right. time, the mayor of London, is his point was he was doing congestion pricing as a transportation benefit. 
And, and um, you know, within the grand scheme of things in London, London collected about $2.5 billion a year in toll fares. Mm -hmm. uh, congestion pricing the first year raised $122 million. So it wasn't, by and large, a, a revenue-raising mechanism. Right. It really was, it was a, a transportation trans mechanism. And it worked. I mean, I, I, as I told you, I, I've lived in London, and it worked in terms of alleviating a lot of the, the traffic problems, except w w when it expired, like the five minutes before, you had this rush of traffic, at least initially, but it worked. And there, there, were, there are any number of things that, that we looked at and you know, we'd like to do better. In fact, some of them they've changed, you know, and they found ways to be able to deal with it. I think that the amazing thing about it actually was the charge didn't get every car off the road. It certainly mm -hmm. didn't do that. Mm -hmm. What it did was it reduced traffic by about 10%. And that number was enough to relieve the congestion that was in the city. Any uh, possibility now, here? I, I think it's a, it's just not today's issue. I think okay. it is a, it's an it's issue gone. that that you know may come up again. Okay. I think uh, undoubtedly it will, but I think it's it's just not today's issue. Okay, let's 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 talk about Albany right now. What have been your conversations with the governor, the legislative leaders, in terms of their response to your needs? So, so let's let, let me just step back from him for a go. second and, and be clear about what's what's happened and go. where we are. Go, I think, go, go. I think it's important context. So, as I said before, we we have uh, run into red ink almost immediately, and and the shortfall we have right now is about eight hundred million dollars. And the shortfall is in the budget that really should have ended on March thirtieth, no, right? It, no, it, we're, we're a calendar year basis. So, so okay. from, from January to December, this budget this year, okay, we're looking at a shortfall of about eight hundred million dollars. Okay. okay. Now, um, uh, where did that come from first? Good. Right? Uh, I, I think the 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 two places to be clear about where it didn't come from, um, it did not come from a shortfall in fares. Our fair revenue is certainly down when you compare it to the highs of 2008, but it's on budget, right? So the point is, it's where we expected it to be. Um, second point, then some people might say, well, it must be expenses. Your expenses are up. Our expenses are where we expected them to be as well. In fact, they're running below where, where we expected them to be. So it's neither one of those two things that's really creating the shortfall that, that we have. So where does it come from? What happens? The, the reality is that the MTA is supported by a series of taxes that, that, that come because we cover roughly about 50% of the cost of our ride from the, from the fare box. The, the uh, situation in December when the state grappled with its deficit reduction plan, um, it uh, took $143 million from the MTA accounts and used it to reduce the state deficit. That was the first place that, that it went. And so in some and ways- your reaction? Well, well the, my, my point was that, that it, it has, you know, if, if that's what's going to happen, then it will have an impact on the services that, right. that we provide. And again, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. But beyond that, there, there was a second thing that was going on, which is that, that I said before this new payroll mobility tax that was enacted. Um, it is not achieving the revenues the way it had been expected to do it. And the, the shortfall is nearly $500 million. Um, and when you couple that, the $143 million, the $500 million, and some other shortfalls and some of the real estate taxes, you get to, to almost $800 mm -hmm. million as a, uh, as a shortfall that's there. The question then became, you know, how do you deal with that? I mean, in essence, I can make any argument to you about this is a bad hand, but it's the hand we've been dealt. Right. right? And you've got and, to play. And, 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 and I have to play based on that hand, and we have to play based on that hand. And, and my, my first priority as is, is this came up was to be able to, to think about um, the question about whether I could look at everybody, everybody up in Albany, every taxpayer, every rider, and say that we were using every dollar we were receiving effectively. Because it seemed to me that if I didn't have the credibility to say that, that it was hard to go back and actually say, gee, I need more money to be able to deal with the Do you the have MTA. that credibility now? Uh, I think we're gaining that credibility, but I don't think we had that credibility. One of the things that, that we started to do was to overhaul the way the MTA did business. Right. I mean, um, new way of doing business. Right. Talk, just talk a little bit about the new way of doing business before we get to my, my favorite questions about fair hikes yeah, and sure. safety. Go ahead. So, 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 you know, the first days that I was at the MTA, I mean, you, you mentioned my, my history. I mean, I, I've been gone for 15 years and, and, you know, I felt it was important in my first uh, 100 days to go around broadly around the system, the entire MTA region, ride every one of the services, effectively kick the tires, uh -huh. uh, meet with our employees, meet with elected officials, meet with the public. I was out broadly across the whole region. And it became apparent in the process of, of those discussions and, and various analyses we were doing 
um, that, that the MTA was not as efficient and effective an organization as it, as it might be. A, a couple examples, Go ahead. I think. Um, if you wanted to call for service information, and you say, is there a number you can call? I would look at you and say, you know something, you're in luck. Because there's not a number you can call. <laughs> there's five numbers. There's 92 numbers. Oh, there are 92 numbers. We have five different call centers. Now, you know, in, in some parts of the world right now, companies, global companies, are running a single call center with a single number that, that, that operates. Uh, you know, we're running in, in, a, in a single region of the New York metropolitan region. We're running five different call centers. We're running 92 different numbers that are taking place. That can't be an efficient way to be able to do business. Um, a, another example that, that, I, uh, that I often go to is the fact that Every one of our businesses are run as separate businesses. So the Long Island Railroad, Imagine right. North, and the subway and the bus system. Um, and effectively, if you think about the MTA, you, we're a merger. We're a merger of, of nearly 40 diff, 25 different companies over the last 40 years. And you know, the, the McKinsey, um, for example, Go ahead. has a practice which is called post-merger management. And you say, well, what's post-merger management? And post-merger management is you find the synergies and you eliminate the redundancies. You feed the synergies, you eliminate the redundancies. So I, mean, I teach this to my students, but um, empirically, what happens? So, 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 you know, you really, the MTA, on the other hand, unfortunately, we did the merger part, but we hadn't done the management part of that. The, the point here is we began to realize and say, you know something, is it really a reason why a shop facility that we have at one of our railroads can't maintain the equipment for another railroad? And the answer is that we can do that, and we're starting to do that. And, and what we're beginning to do now is to treat the MTA as one industrial company, um, all of which is the MTA, right. and find efficient ways to do it. So if we maintain a Long Island Railroad locomotive at, at a shop that we just built in, in Metro North Territory, mm. so be it. If we have um, air conditioning units that are maintained in a different place, so be it. Okay, so you can you can squeeze out efficiencies. So, can you squeeze out enough efficiencies to substantially reduce your shortfalls in this fiscal uh, year or next? I mean, aren't yes. there limits of efficiencies? Well, whether well, you can squeeze out a significant efficiency, let's talk about some of the things we've done. Right off the bat, we decided we would reduce administrative costs at the MTA. I mean, this is the, the back office that people don't see. It doesn't affect day-to-day -day services. We've reduced administrative staff at the MTA by 15% across the board. We've reduced administrative staff at headquarters by 20%, just a, a reduction in, in, in the number of people who are going to be okay. doing that. Okay. Uh, efficiency saving this right there. We went on from that and began to look at some other things. We began to, to look at, at places in which we said, um, where are our largest suppliers to the MTA? Right. Um, and we took our 50 largest contracts and we went back to all of them the, exactly the way a business would go back to them. And we said, you know something, we are in a very difficult financial problem. Um, we need to work with you to find better ways to be able to do this, renegotiate our contracts. Otherwise, we won't be able to keep providing all this. Okay. So they came back and helped. This is good news. They but came back come and Come on, helped. we want to hear some bad news. I yeah. want to talk to you about, first of all, before we get to the bad news, if you will, a larger question that's implicit in what you just said about this merger, should the MTA exist? If you were to design a, a, a statewide or regional transportation system, would it be the MTA or would it be something else? For example, could you break off New York City Transit Authority and have that run better because of its customer base, subsidies, et cetera, then tying it to Metro North and the Long Island Railroad. Should you be the head of this, I mean, not you be the head of this organization, should this organization exist? Uh, look, I think it, it's always a fair question to ask that, and I think it's important, by the way, that we always ask and convince ourselves we're doing it the right, right. way. I don't, I don't have any problem with that. Right. I don't have any problem with that at all. The, the, the New York metropolitan region is unique in this country. We are, I mean, to say we're transit dependent is, is an understatement, right? right? It is our life. Sure. It's our, our lifeblood uh, of this region. It's not just our lifeblood for the, for the five boroughs of New York City. It's our lifeblood for the, for the, for the sure. entire region. I think when the, the idea of the creation of the MTA w was put forth in, in the 1960s, they seized upon something that, that actually has been usually important. And let's face it, by the way, that over that period of time, we have seen a, a rebirth and a resurgence of our transit system in a way that we might not have imagined before. 
So it's the answer is delivered. we should keep it essentially structurally the way it is with management, some management reorganization and efficiency. But we should and we should hold the management accountable for showing that it's really an efficient operation. My point about making every dollar count for the MTA is that that I now feel doing the things that we're doing, showing people that we're reducing costs. I feel much more confident looking at you, looking at, at taxpayers, looking at elected officials, and saying this is an organization that's doing more of what it needs to do. One of the difficulties that you've pointed out, and, and pointed out rather sharply, calling them the shame of the system, are TWU work rules, labor union work rules. Talk about the, the problems and opportunities inherent there. Right. And, and I think, Doug, I mean, one of the points I'd make here is that, that my, my comment about the shame of the system is about the work rules, not about the people. Right. Because I, and I think it's very important to say that because the fact of the matter is that I think the strongest transit system we can have is if we have a, a, a well-compensated, well-trained workforce that is dedicated to our system. By and large, that's what we have across the, the board at the MTA. Um, my, my point is, is the following. We have a, have a, a well-compensated workforce. What we have to ensure is we have a fully productive workforce. Over many years, work rules have developed that, that are not designed in any way to ensure the productivity and efficiency of the system. Give me a couple of illustrations. Well, an, an illustration would be that, that uh, we operate services where we drive a bus in, for example, from Staten Island, an express bus in mm -hmm. from Staten Island. That bus driver is, is qualified to drive an express bus, He's, he or she is qualified to drive a local bus. Right. Um, it, it turns out, of course, that there's relatively little need to drive an express bus in after the morning rush. Sure. I mean, it's really a rush hour service that we have. Um, we have work rules that um, prevent that driver from parking the express bus at a depot in Manhattan and taking out a local bus and, and providing local service. I hate to see that, right? Mm -hmm. Because the fact is that that person could be more productively employed uh, during that uh, period of time. How do these work rules change? For example, I mean, you're, you're, you're limited in your power. After all, the arbitrator awarded an 11% increase in salaries over three years over, over essentially your objections. Yes. And so I think you have, I, I think. What, how can you then, how can you, the agency, the state, grapple with this? Or is it simply a political question and we leave it in the political arena totally? But I, but I don't think it is just a political Go question, on. and I think this is the importance of it. I mean, I think the objection that the MTA had to the, to the package that the arbitrator was awarding was that, that we felt that it was beyond their ability to pay. I mean, the, 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 if you go back to the, to the rules that exist in terms of that arbitration, an, ar, an, an arbitration panel works under a set of criteria. Right. One of those criteria um, is called ability to pay. Um, it was clear that the MTA was already in financial crisis at this at right. this point in time, and indeed, since that time, the financial crisis has only gotten worse. Right. So I feel very strongly that we were right in making the argument about ability to mm -hmm. pay. Um, my point about that is um, I actually don't want to take things out of people's pockets. I don't mind people receiving a raise. I think we can pay for it effectively by gaining productivity in the in the system, make ourselves more efficient and more productive in the way that we're in the way that we're doing it. Now, where are we today? We're grappling with the worst financial crisis that the MTA and, and the city and state have seen, I think, since the fiscal crisis in the 70s. I mean, I grew up in, in, that, in that period. We, we talked about it earlier. And sure. It, it, it's deep in our memory. And I think that the, the point I'd make about this is that it's, it's something that we have to grapple with together. When, when, when I said before that I'm, I'm overhauling the MTA and turning over every stone, I hope I'm building the credibility that um, I'm not leaving management out of what we're of what we're doing. Right. I'm not leaving our suppliers in other ways uh, out of what we're doing, and we're, we are looking at every way we can be able to do it. But equally, we have to be able to look at things and be able to say, how can we improve the service that we're providing? How can we do it more efficiently? And how do we work together in labor management partnership to achieve that? Okay, two questions that I, as an inveterate subway rider, ask, and my my fellow riders ask. One is, how safe are we from attack? And clearly, you guys have been on the front page of the Daily News, see no evil about these security cameras. Talk about that, and then let's get to the center of this, fair hikes and service cuts. Talk about safety first. Okay, look, I, I think the, first off, let's, let's be very clear. The, 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 the crime in the subway is its lowest level ever. Uh, the NYPD Commissioner Ray Kelly have done an absolutely terrific job of policing the, the subway, and I think we should start by, by, by putting credit 
uh, putting credit there. I think the second point is that, that we've tried to use technology to assist in that mm -hmm. effort in, in, in various ways. Um, one of the things that people said to me when I was doing my due diligence about this job was that the MTA doesn't do technology. Um, uh, I, I don't think that's right, but, but it's safe to say the track record hasn't been, hasn't been terrific. So what about these cameras? The, the, the cameras should have been up <clears throat> and should have been functional a, a while ago. Um, I've actually not been worrying so much about looking in the rearview mirror to figure out what has happened in the past and why that right. happened. I'll tell you where I've been focused and how do I get these things operational okay. right now. These cameras will be operational next month. Okay. That's, that's and the point all, about, all of them. Oh, oh, the, this, this set of 900 and some odd cameras will be, will be operational next month. There's another set of cameras that will be operational at the beginning of, of 2011. Um, the, the fact is that, that you know, we've looked at all the places where we had investments mm -hmm. that, that were not fully operational. We put together a plan to be able to get them fully operational. I think we'll meet that plan, we'll meet that schedule, we'll meet that, that objective that's there. Uh, okay, fair hikes and service cuts. What and where? Well, we, we enacted earlier this year as part of the plan to be able to deal with the shortfall that we, that we had, uh, we enacted a series of service changes across the city. Now, that's a painful process. And also on through. throughout the system. I mean, throughout the system. On, it wasn't just this, the city, this right? This past right. Monday, you right. service Absolutely. cuts on the Long Island Railroad. And, and I think that's important, by the way, as well. I mean, again, you asked this question about one MTA and about, about right. the region. I would say that the, the, the difficulties we're facing is, is hitting every part of our service. It, right. it, no, no, no parts left out. But we enacted a set of service changes that are they were painful to do. Um, we, we held nine public hearings. 2,500 people came. I sat in those hearings and listened to the voices explaining the-, the Angry voices. Well, they were angry voices. And frustrated, voices. but go ahead. And, 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 and I understand why. Right, right. I, I, I understand right. why um, and, and, and in doing that. Um, but we did enact a, a series of changes. I think we, we tried to do it in as open and transparent fashion as, as has ever been done, published a lot of information about it, engaged the debate, and changed some of our decisions on the basis of what came in through that process. Um, I am uh, extremely hopeful that that is the end of the service cut process that, that, it, that is there. I think one of the things that those hearings underscored was how critically important our transit services are for people all across this region. Fair hikes, there's a 7.5% increase schedule for January 211. Yeah. So is uh, that is is that it? I mean, or do I mean is this the first of a wave? I mean, you still have this 800 million dollar shortfall. Where is it going? You can all in efficiencies, no tolls, no more fair hikes. So so let, let's let's go back to it. the Ravage Commission and the, the what came out of the the Albany plan that was enacted mm -hmm. just a year ago last May recognized that fares regular fare increases, periodic fare increases, and in their their view was every two years uh, should be part of the MTA's business right. plan. Right. Um, uh, I'd strongly support that. By the way, I mean the fares in London. We talked about London before. The fares in London go up annually on the first Sunday in January. Well, um, let me just interrupt for a second. The fares in New York are a steal compared to London. We are. always talk about how wonderful London is. London is expensive. We are cheap, cheap, cheap. And we're even cheaper than you, uh, uh, that, than we, we talk about. We're not even two and a quarter, because two and a quarter is the headline fare. That's right. Very few people pay two and a quarter. I don't pay two and a quarter. Right? I mean, you buy a bonus ride, or you yep. buy a monthly pass, yep. you buy a weekly yep. pass. Yep. Very yep. few yep. people pay two and a quarter. And on top of that, <clears throat> you know, unlike when I was a kid or when you were a kid, we give you a free subway bus transfer now in a way that we didn't do at, That's that, right. time, at that time as well. So, so I, I think the fares are... Uh, are relatively inexpensive. I don't mean to say they don't take a bite out of people's wallet right. in doing that. But I also think we have a responsibility um, to try to show, again, this efficiency of the way that we're doing it. Um, from the beginning, what I've said is it's my intent to, to hold to the schedule of fare increases that have been laid out uh, by the legislature, by the governor, as part of the Ravage Commission report. And the reason is that I think the idea of regular fare increases on, an every, on a biannual basis makes a lot of sense for the region. But how do you close an $800 million gap? Um, you close an $800 million gap by... <clears throat> the types of initiatives that I've that I've already laid out that are that are saving real money, mm -hmm. uh, that are saving real money. Administrative headcount is fifty million dollars this year. Renegotiating with suppliers is twenty million dollars this year. Seventy million dollars over the life of the contracts. Uh, cutting out projects in our operating budget that we deemed to be less than essential was another forty million dollars this year. We're controlling overtime. We're consolidating different parts of the MTA. Do we climb all the way to eight hundred million dollars? I'm not sure yet. I I'm really not not sure yet in in, in doing it. But but the contingency plans, would you like to I mean, 
Suppose if you're only at six hundred million, well, where well, does the other two hundred million come I, from? You know, I get asked this question all the time, and, and my answer is that that the the MTA has a process for a July financial plan. Right. And uh, that financial plan has to take into account what we're doing in the cost saving uh, initiatives that we have. It will take into account the reduction in the subsidies that are there. It will allow us the six months of time to see how subsidies have come in over the over the course of the year, how tax revenue is coming in, the degree to which the economy is or is not recovering from any of the uh, the downturn that we're uh, that we're seeing right now. We'll project all of that into the financial plan. That's the time to actually have the discussion about uh, fares. My my point about it is we're 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 very much holding and working toward the schedule that that had been laid out before, um, you know, and we'll we'll look at it in the in the financial plan. I have a singular focus right now, which is drive the cost out of the company in a way that, that protects our services, protects what we do to our customers. That's what I'm focused on. And, and I'm not getting diverted by, by doing other parts of it. That's what we're focusing on right now. And you are, and you are sanguine that the, the state's political leadership will provide you the resources and the leeway to do what you want? Well, I think, that, I think I'm, the political leadership of the state recognizes what I'm doing. They've been supportive of the fact that I am uh, trying uh, to be able to deal with what is a difficult hand and a difficult situation and not a situation that, that had been expected uh, in, in being able to do it. At the same time, let's face it, the state is grappling with a, a $10 billion plus uh, financial hole up in Albany. Um, and I think the, the political leadership, I mean, if you look at the budgets that were, were su submitted by the governor, the assembly, and the Senate, um, there's very little money in there for the MTA. Um, the, the fact of the matter is that we're going to have to find a way to be able to work through this crisis. Thank you. Uh, I presume that you will be available to talk about this as we move down the line? I, I'd love to. Look, I... Look, I, I um, we have a great system. We, it, it's the, as I said, the lifeblood of our region. The, the you know, the, the foundation of it in a, in a literal and figurative sense. Um, and I know that it matters to New Yorkers. I'm more than happy to keep talking about it. Thank you. Next week, we'll talk with Michael Sorkin, distinguished professor of architecture and the director of the graduate program in urban design at CUNY City College, and the author of 20 Minutes in Manhattan. Join us. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email, whatever it is. Thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it, send it. <laughs>